came across that song kind of by accident this week. Felt it set off my message so well. Frederick M. Lehman is an author and composer of over a hundred published hymns. Most of them are not very well known, but one is. And Frederick wrote about it in a booklet that he wrote in 1948. He was at a camp meeting 50 years earlier. And at the end of the message, the evangelist quoted a poem. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Fred Frederick was deeply moved by the poem. He got a copy of it. He kept it for many years. During this time, he discovered that the poem had been found on the wall of a patient's room in a mental hospital. This poor troubled man had poured out his heart of love to God. But where had it come from? It seemed that a poem like that must have come from someone else. And after a long search, he found the poem in a book, written and in a book. The poem was written by a Jewish poet, Mir ben Isaac Nehorai, in 1050. It was a hymn sung in Jewish synagogues during the Feast of Weeks. And Frederick imagined Mir ben Isaac standing on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, the love of God sweeping over him. And in his imagination, the oceans were filled with ink. The marsh stalks became quills. The overarching skies became scrolls. And he pictured scribes running out of quills, running out of ink, running out of scrolls as they tried to describe the all-compelling, amazing love of God. The words of that poem kept ringing in his mind. And one day during a break at work in 1917, he picked up a scrap of paper and he added the first two verses and a chorus to the song. His daughter composed the music. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. The angels' song, the saints and angels' song. A wonderful song that we continue to sing today. Valentine's Day was this past week, a celebration of love. I was in Winnipeg, and Duane was in Estevan on Valentine's Day. And as I thought of today, as I was in Winnipeg and what I was going to share, my mind was drawn to John 3.16 a verse that describes God's great love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. When life is shaken, when we're feeling discouraged and disoriented, there are truths that are eternal and unwavering and firm that we can hang on to. God so loved the world. So this morning, I just want to remind us again of God's love. I typed in the word love in my Bible program. There are many words that are adjectives that describe the word love. Over and over we read of God's unfailing love. Corey read from Psalms 33:18, The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope, those who hope in his unfailing love. Some translations would say steadfast love. And then verse 22, may your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Unfailing love, unfailing love, no limits. Paul writes that love never fails. You can put God's name in, in place of love because God is love. God's love never fails. It's permanent, it will last forever. It never dies. It never ends. It's eternal. Governments fail. Parents fail. Teachers fail. We fail. But God's love never fails. Our money may run out, but God's love 
won't. God's love is priceless. It's faithful. It's everlasting. It's eternal. It's great. The adjectives when you look just keep piling up. God's love is better than life. It's higher than the heavens. We're told that the earth is full of God's love and that God abounds in love. Our God, whose love is beyond description, beyond our human com comprehension, knows you. He knows you. He knows you by name. He knew you before you were born. God created this great and beautiful world in which we love, in, in which we live. And in love, God pursues us. He draws us close to himself. And he desires us to draw close to him. And we, we may question God's love at times, especially when life is hard. But scripture promises and shows us that God knows us, that his concern is our salvation. And in love, he chose us to be his own, his own sons and daughters, and that he promises never to leave us. I love these words in Ephesians. Paul writes, God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. All according to his pleasure and will. That word pleasure stopped me. God's very character is pleasure. His very character is pleased that we are his sons and daughters. He takes pleasure in us. He delights in us. And the Goes on to, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2 that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in sin. It's incredible. God knows us. And God loves us. For God so loved the world. That world's word so can mean that he loves the world so very much, or way more, or lots and lots. But it can also mean in this way or in this manner. God so loved the world in this way. And if we want to know what way, we go back to the verse before. John is describing how God loved the world, the way he loves us, and he points us back to the verse before this, this, uh, this verse and the story that's connected to it. In, Nova, in uh, Numbers 21, the people of Israel are traveling through the desert towards the promised land. They complain about the same old food that they're eating all this time, this manna, this bread that God provides them with every day. I would imagine the people in Haiti would be glad for some manna right now. So God sends poisonous snakes into the camp, and many are bitten and die. And the people are sorry for their complaining, and they cry out for mercy. So, God, so Moses cries out to God, on their behalf and God tells Moses to make a bronze figure of a snake and attach it to the top of a pole and if you are bitten by a snake you're to look up at the bronze snake and you will live God provides a way for them to be saved then we jump ahead now to the beginning of James of John 3 and we meet we read the meeting between Jesus and a religious leader Nicodemus Nicodemus is zealous, he's devoted to God, he's serious about following all of God's ways and all of God's laws, but Jesus tells him that that's not good enough. To be part of God's family, you need to be born into it. You need to be born again. And that may sound impossible, but God's provided the way, his very own son. And the verse before John 3.16 says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is how God loves the world. He provides a way for us to come to him, to know him. Jesus is lifted up on the cross in the same manner as the bronze snake. And all who look to him will be saved, they'll be born again, 
they will become children of God. They will receive eternal life, which doesn't mean just someday way off in the future, but it's eternal life that starts right now. And this is how God has lavished his love upon us so that we can be children of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God so loved that he gave. Out of his great love, he gave the greatest gift that he could possibly give, a gift that cost him dearly. But oh, the joy of that gift. Because of God's gift of love, his gift of Jesus, we can be set free from sin, from fear, from everything that entangles and traps us. I was reminded of John's words in his first letter. He said, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then one of my favorite verses is found in Romans 5. It says, God shows his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. What a picture of being loved completely, and totally, and fully, and perfectly. I had to think of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, in love, God created our world. He created, created these first two human beings. When they sinned, they hid, but God came looking for them. They didn't even say they were sorry or acknowledge, take ownership for what they did. But God forgave them and provided for them. And while they and us, while we were sinners, not looking for God or forgiveness, not repentant or admitting our guilt, before any of that, in love, Jesus came looking for us. He lived and he provided the way for us to come to him. He died, he shed his blood so that we could be forgiven, that we could be set free, that we could live for him as kingdom people in his new kingdom. We can't imagine that kind of love. It's hard to even talk about because words don't seem to be enough. This kind of love is beyond us. It's the kind of love that we can't control or manipulate, which is what we like to do. God's love is given for us without us even asking for it. Jesus journeyed to the cross. He suffered. He died in our place. And he desires our love in return. And also with our love, he desires our very lives, every part of us. And we can respond. We can respond in love, committing our lives wholly to the one who loved us first, who loves us completely for who we are, who, the one who can hold us amongst the turmoil of our world, the only one who will never leave us, who loves us even when we feel like we are unlovable will bring us into his glorious presence forever. I wish I had the abilities of Mir Ben Isaac that I could express and pen words expressing the measureless, unfailing, price, priceless, great, abounding, eternal, faithful love of God. I'm so glad for scripture that does. And my prayer is that we grasp just a little bit more this morning how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love really is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it's so great, you will never understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for your love this morning, Lord Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, that even when we didn't know you at all, even when we weren't aware of you, that you reached out to us. You drew near to us. Lord, I thank you that when we sin, and we may be ashamed to even come to you, but you come to us. In love, you draw near to us. 
Thank you, O Lord, that when we don't even want to acknowledge our sin, you are there offering us forgiveness, providing a way through. What amazing love. What amazing love. Lord, may our hearts be gripped with the love of God today in a new way. Lord, I pray that as we go about our week, that love of God will hold us, that it will be that rock on which we can stand, fortress in the midst of whatever we are facing, and that we may give you our love in return, more and more as we walk with you. Lord, I thank you so much for each one here, for those who aren't, I pray your blessing upon each one. I pray that we may be a blessing as we have been blessed. I pray that as we go out into our activities for this next week, that you would surprise us with opportunities along the way, that we may share the love of Jesus with others around us, and that they may encounter you, that they may feel you drawing near to them through us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.